OK. So I got Mark Hala here. OK. Now. We're going to take a look at today. Um, objectives five and six over chapter 12, the nervous system. So our focus is going to be on chapter 12, objective five, which talks about how the signal gets into the neuron. So our main focus is at the dendrite level today in the cell body, because this is where the information comes in. When we come in on Tuesday, um, we're going to take a look at that signal as it moves down the axon. And then we're going to take a look at what happens to the signal as it gets to the axon terminal. So we're taking the neuron in pieces. Today we're looking at, hey, how does that signal get into the cell? Uh, and I will tell you guys, your test is scheduled. I don't know what the dates are, but I'll probably have a change of the date on your Moodle page. It's April the 4th. So... The deadlines might be a little earlier than that. I'm fixing to change all those deadlines, but your test, everything is going to be due April the 4th. So I'm just throwing that out there. Okay, let's talk about what a stimulus is. A stimulus is basically the problem. It's the incoming information that's being brought into the central nervous system. Um, we're going to use this uh, sensory neurons. And that information, that stimulus can come in on the dendrite, or the cell body of another neuron. So I know that in the past we've said, hey, you know, the dendrites receive the information, but you know what? Cell bodies can receive information as well. Now, the stimulus that comes in could be weak or could be strong. For example, you can differentiate a dim light versus a bright light. You can tell the difference between a quiet noise versus a loud noise. So it's not that the stimulus comes in is that you can determine the intensity with which it comes in. Your body can differentiate you eating one piece of cake, causing a slight rise in blood sugar, to four pieces of cake if you were just having a bad day, um, causing a dramatic rise in blood sugar. Your body can tell the difference. So these incoming stimuli, again, could be strong, could be weak, or anywhere in between. So because they can have a varying degree, they're called graded potentials. So stimuli, also known as graded potentials. Now, if the stimulus coming in is strong enough, you're going to get what's called an action potential generated from that. Remember, we said that the axon hillock part of the neuron kind of decides whether the signal is going to continue on down the cell or whether it's going to die out. Well, if it continues on down the cell, it's called an action potential. If it dies out, well, you don't get an action potential. So let me give you an example here. So we have skin right here. And there's pressure being put on the skin. That's that weak stimulus. So you've got pressure being put on the skin. Let's say, not to creep anybody out, but let's say maybe there's an ant walking on your skin. Do you know there's an ant walking on your skin? Probably not till it bites you. You probably don't recognize there's an ant there. So does that mean the ant's not putting pressure on your skin by walking? Oh, no, they are. But it's not causing enough of a signal it's going to die out and there's not going to be an action potential generated. So your brain's never going to know about it unless the, unless the thing bites you. Now, let's say that a dog steps on you. Are you going to be able to tell that a dog stepped on you? Absolutely. So that's going to be a big amount of pressure on the skin. And that is going to trigger all the dendrites, let's say, to send information to the brain to say, hey, a dog just stepped on top of me. That's going to be a strong stimulus. So that is going to create an action potential. Um, so again, the stimulus can be anywhere from weak to strong or anywhere in between. These are called graded potentials. Now, you've got a handout. We're going to take a look at this handout. I see if I already picked up all our papers, and I think I did. There we go. So this first, this first one that we're going to take a look at
Huh? I'm not going to get another one. <laughs> no, pretty it's pretty cool. Cool. I feel like I'm probably not going to have enough burning. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you actually. Okay, so we've got a. We're going to first talk about image one. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys that this stimulus in image one. Post that shot now? Yeah, if you have it. I'm so, so sorry. This is so disappointing. You are fine. So just decided to not be, <laughs> not be sharp anymore. Yeah. Let's go real low. Yeah, I think that should work. Thank you. Are you good? Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no, we, we don't have anywhere to put that thing. So that's why we have to keep putting it away and then bringing it back out again. No, you're not fine. You're fine. That's what we have it for. Okay, so this in this first image here, I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys that the stimulus is weak. Now, how do I know it's a weak stimulus? If you look at the size of the arrow, it's smaller than, look down at the second picture, do you see how big that arrow is there? That's a strong stimulus. So the size of the arrow is kind of giving you an indication as to the intensity of the stimulus. So that's why I can tell you that it's a weak stimulus. Now let's take a look at kind of what we've got going on here. So we have this little blip right there. So what is that little blip right there? This is the axon terminal of a neuron. And the axon terminal is communicating with this next neuron. So here's the other neuron right there. So you're saying the synaptic terminal is the same thing as an axon terminal? Yes. Okay. Okay, so here's the other cell, and we're going to call that this is the cell body, as you can see, and the axon of a different neuron. Right, it's receiving the signal, so I'm calling it the receiving neuron, whereas the one up here is the sending neuron. Right, because it's sending the signal to the receiving neuron, so I hope that makes sense. Now, when the neuron, notice it's being sent on the cell body, notice it's receiving the signal on the cell body. I told you all the other day that dendrites received the signal, but I just told you a second ago, okay, it's dendrites, but it could also be the cell body. So the cell body is receiving the incoming signal, and look at what happens to the incoming signal as it moves through the cell body. Do you all see what's happening there? This, the arrows are fading in intensity, so the signal is getting weaker, as it moves through the cell body. So from where it entered the cell, as it moves through the cell body, that signal is losing intensity. That's normal. Graded potentials do that. They lose intensity. So we can actually measure the intensity. I want you to take a look at these graphs over here. So we're just going to call this graph number one, graph number two, and graph number three. Uh, I do want to identify for you all this um, dotted line with a T beside it, that means threshold. And you can see it's at minus 55 millivolts. It's always at minus 55 millivolts. And we said when the cell is at rest, it is minus 70. So initially the cell is at rest. I'm just going to put a little R there. So the cell is at rest. The stimulus comes along and right here we can pick up what that stimulus measurement is. So instead of saying weak or strong, we can actually give it a number. We can quantify the intensity of the stimulus and take a look. It's sitting at, I don't know, minus 40. So when this stimulus arrived, it changed the membrane from minus 70 to minus 40. So we created a big change in the charge of the membrane. Now, as we move down the cell and we get, I don't know, about midway down um, in the cell body, we can pick up a measurement again and see what the intensity of the signal is there. And look what happened. We said that as the signal moves down the cell, it gets weaker. Well, look, it dropped. It wasn't minus 40. Now, by the time it's halfway through the cell, it's dropped to minus 55. So it's getting closer to where it originated, right, at minus 70. So the signal is getting weaker. Now, you can pick up a measurement again. 
right here at what they're calling the trigger zone. Now, we now know that trigger zone has an official name called the axon hillock. And if you remember the job of the axon hillock from the other day, the job of the axon hillock was to take this graded potential coming in and determine if we're going to continue the signal or if we're just going to let it die out. Remember, it was the deciding factor. Does it go on or do we get rid of it? So it all matters as to what the intensity of the signal is by the time it reaches the axon hillock. So if you take a look at the measurement there, you can see the measurement is probably sitting at, I don't know, minus 60 millivolts. Notice it's below threshold. So what does that mean? Well, if it's below threshold, the axon hillock is not going to generate an action potential. So basically nothing is going to happen. The signal wasn't strong enough by the time it got to the deciding factor to do anything. So nothing's going to happen here. So let's take a look at image two, which is going to show us a little bit stronger image. I'm sorry, a little bit stronger stimulus to start with. So we still have our sending on right here. Um, we have our receiving on in blue that I'm kind of putting in here. Um, just to kind of show you what we got. So this is our receiving. And the orange one we put up here was the sending. So it's trying to deliver the signal to the receiving neuron. So it's going to come in on the cell body. And just like it did earlier, as you move through the cell body, that signal, because it's a graded potential, is going to get weaker. But you can measure the intensity of the signal. So if you notice, when it first came in, we're going to look at our little graphs over here. The threshold, which is at minus 55 always, is what we're looking at. Notice when it first came in, it was a little bit stronger than the other one. We could say it was, I don't know, minus 35 millivolts. By the time it got halfway down the cell, the intensity was, I don't know, maybe about minus 40 millivolts. And by the time it reached the trigger zone, also known as the axon hillock, the intensity... Again, we know it's going to drop, but it dropped to about minus 50 millivolts, but we are above threshold. We're still above that threshold line by the time we get to the deciding factor there. So if we're above threshold at the axon hillock, what's going to happen? We're going to generate an action potential that's going to move down the axon to the end of the cell. So that's, that's kind of what's going on. So... The one that we really are interested in is where is it at the axon hillock? Is it above or below threshold at the axon hillock? That's the one that's going to decide if we stop the signal or if we generate an action potential and continue the signal. Uh, and again, the stronger the incoming stimulus, the more likely it will be at or above threshold by the time it reaches the axon hillock. Okay, confusing a little bit. I know this is this is a tough day. This is a tough day. A lot to remember. It is a lot. It is a lot, and I don't have any in-class questions for y'all today. Um, normally I do, but we don't have time for in-class questions today. So one of the other things I wanted to talk to y'all about are the three characteristics of this incoming stimulus, of this incoming graded potential. So what are your three characteristics? Well, one of them is when this incoming stimulus comes in, when this graded potential comes in, it's only affecting that one little section of the cell. So it's not that the graded potential hits the cell body and the whole cell knows about it. No, nope, it's called a localized change. Only that one little area knows what's going on. The rest of the cell is just business as usual. It's still at rest. 
So just that one little area is affected. So it's a localized change. These graded potentials do not travel very far uh, before they die out. The stronger they are, the farther they can travel, though, obviously. Um, so again, the graded potential is going to get weaker as it diffuses from the source. But the big question is, what's it going to be by the time it reaches the axon hill? Like, is it still going to be there, or is it going to have died out before it gets there? Okay, another characteristic of a graded potential is called summation. So we're going to take a look again. Sorry, I keep flip-flopping back and forth, but that's what we're doing today is flip-flopping back and forth. So we're going to take a look at the next handout, which is talking about the characteristics of the graded potentials. We talked about characteristic number one, which had to do with localized changes on the cell body only. Now we're going to look at characteristic number two, which is summation. So I wanted to put a picture up here so you can kind of see what's going on with summation. Uh, let's take a look first at our at what we're looking at here. So we've got this neuron right here. These neuron axon terminals are coming in and communicating with the axon. So we've got axon terminal number one. We've got axon terminal number two, and we've got axon terminal number three. All of these axon terminals that we're talking about are the sending neurons, right? They're sending the signal to the next cell. Now, y'all, I'm real tired of already saying the word sending neuron, so let's give this a, an official name besides the sending neuron. Uh, do you all see that there is a gap right here between the axon terminal of one neuron and the cell body of another neuron? That's always the case. There's always a gap. That gap is called a synapse. So the sending neuron comes before the synapse. Right? Makes sense. It comes before the synapse. So the sending neurons are really called presynaptic neurons. That's their official name because they come before the synapse, which means this neuron here, which is receiving the information, This comes after the synapse, so its official name is the postsynaptic neuron. So I'm going to try to use those terms rather than sending and receiving because those are the official names of these cells. So we've got the pre we've got several presynaptic neurons trying to send a signal to the postsynaptic neuron. So we've got some signals coming in. Uh, take a look, though. You see these little plus signs right here in these axon terminals? Those little plus signs let you know that these are excitatory signals. They're going to excite the postsynaptic cell. And take a look. They're graded potentials, so they come in and then dissipate as they move through the cell body. They get weaker as they go through the cell body because, you know, that's what the signals do. They get weaker. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you all that these signals that are coming in are below threshold. So each of these is weak. Individually, they're not going to create anything. Those are going to die out before they get where they're going. But a characteristic of these graded potentials is you can actually add them together. So if they all hit the axon hillock at about the same time, you see what happened? They got stronger. They all showed up at the same time at the same place. So you can add them together to create a 
signal that's actually above threshold or a stronger signal. So you can add these together and what happens is because it created a stronger signal, by the time it reached the trigger zone, it was above threshold and it generated an action potential. So yes, you can add incoming signals together if they're all hitting the neuron about the same time you can add them together and get a pretty strong signal i kind of think about it like the bug slides if y'all have ever seen that movie where one little ant can't defeat the grasshoppers but the army can so again together they're going to be stronger and you can get um, something that comes up from that now another characteristic of these graded potentials so we talked about how they only change the uh, postsynaptic cell locally. We talked about how you can add them all together and sum them together to get a stronger signal for many weak ones. But you can also, and I'm sorry, this is the wrong word here, should not be summation for characteristic number three. That should say excitatory or inhibitory. These signals can be excitatory or inhibitory. Now, in the previous one that we saw, it was excitatory. We saw that because of the plus sign. So if we take a look at this neuron right here, again, this is the presynaptic cell. Uh, you can take a look and see there's a plus sign there. So that plus sign, again, is letting you know, hey, this is excitatory. It's going to excite the postsynaptic cell. So here is our postsynaptic cell here. Our receiving cell. So it's receiving that excitatory signal. Now, let's take a look at what's going on here in the graph. So we're sitting at minus 70 millivolts because the cell is at rest initially. But then when the stimulus comes along, right there, look at what happens. The membrane potential becomes more positive. In an excitatory, signal, the membrane potential gets closer to threshold. Do you all see where that threshold line is? See how when that signal came in, it took it up? closer to threshold so the potential for creating something and getting something to happen increased because this excitatory potential came through so because this presynaptic neuron is trying to excite the postsynaptic neuron the signal is called an excitatory postsynaptic potential it's trying to excite the cell after the synapse um, so it's also known as an epsp now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that anytime you have an excitatory signal, that's called depolarization. And that's all I'm going to say about depolarization today. I'm just throwing that word out there, and we'll talk more about it on Tuesday, but I'm just introducing you to a new term. We'll talk more about depolarization next time. So now let's take a look at the other cell in the picture here, which is also a presynaptic cell that is trying to communicate with the postsynaptic cell. presynaptic because it comes before the synapse. But take a look at what kind of signal it is. Notice the minus sign right here. That's telling you it's an inhibitory signal. So again, we've got our picture over here. We're at rest at minus 70 millivolts. And when that signal comes along, look, look which way it causes that graph to go causes it to go down, it's becoming more negative. So in an inhibitory signal, the membrane potential 
gets farther away from threshold. Now remember, you've got to get to threshold for something to happen. So this inhibitory signal is going to make sure you're getting anywhere nowhere near threshold. We're getting further away. So we're trying to prevent something from happening. So this inhibitory signal, because it's inhibiting the postsynaptic cell, is called an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, or an IPSP. And any time you have a signal that takes you farther away from threshold, that results in what's called a hyperpolarization. So again, we'll talk more about hyperpolarization next time. Um, this middle one, we're not even going to look at. So that's why we didn't look at that one. We're not going to worry about that one. Okay. Oh, no. Flash, boom, bang. So, bless you. No, you're okay. Just a review. Pick up everything out and drop on the floor. Just to review the, the three characteristics of a graded potential, we started out with the first characteristic we mentioned were just localized changes. They're not going to travel very far. The second characteristic we looked at was summation, meaning you can take multiple incoming signals, add them together to get something stronger. And then the third type of characteristic of this incoming potential means it could be either excitatory or inhibitory. So if it's excitatory, it's going to result um, in getting that potential closer to threshold. If it's inhibitory, you're getting further away from threshold. So let's take a look at the stimulus and threshold for a second. We're going to take a look at another handout. And this handout is going to be this one here. And I have them labeled on your Moodle page as handout one, two, three, and four, I believe, for this set of um, notes for chapter 12, objective five and six. And if I don't have them on your Moodle page yet, I will shortly. I can't remember if they made it to your Moodle page or not. We're first just going to look at this bottom picture. So we're just going to kind of ignore this top picture for now. Too much going on on the page. We're just going to look at the bottom picture. I do want to make a little correction here. I'm not sure what happened to the minus 70 button, but the 7 seemed to have just fallen off into oblivion. I don't know where it went. Um, we have threshold. And remember, threshold is minus 55. So the minus 70, that's rest. The cell is at rest. Now, we have these three different stimuli coming in, um, three different intensities of stimuli coming in. So this first one, we're going to call it stimulus number one. Do you see that it's below threshold? So instead of calling it stimulus number one, we could call it a sub-threshold stimulus which is telling you, hey, it's below threshold. Now, what happens in a sub-threshold stimulus? Nothing. I'm just going to abbreviate action potential as AP. You don't get anything. Nothing's going to happen. The signal's going to die out. Nobody's going to know any different. Now, let's take a look at stimulus number two, which is a little bit more intense than the first one. Notice stimulus number two just barely reaches threshold. I mean, it's right there at threshold. So we're going to call this a threshold stimulus. I mean, it did reach threshold, but barely. So are we going to get an action potential out of this? Well, it reached threshold. So sure, we're going to get an action potential. Now let's take a look at stimulus number three. This is an above threshold stimulus. I'll give it an official name later. Now, because this went above the threshold, are you going to get an action potential out of this one? Yes. So how does your body differentiate between 
stimulus number two, which is barely at threshold, to stimulus number three, which is pretty more, which is much more intense. You're going to get action potentials out of both of these. So how does your body know, oh, you just ate a little bit of cake, so your blood sugar went up a little bit, so we just need to secrete a little bit of insulin versus, well, you were having a bad day, you ate the whole darn cake. Your blood sugar went up, spiked. I mean, it just like shot up like crazy. And we need to secrete all the insulin we have. So how does your body know the difference? Now we're going to take a look at the top picture. So looking at stimulus number one, do you see an action potential? No, no action potential. Nothing happened. That line is just as flat as it can be. I do want to have you to take a look at these action potentials that are being generated. So this right here is the representative of one action potential. And if you take a look at that action potential, do you see that they all look the same? I mean, if, if I were to pick out any one of those, they'd look just the same as all the other ones do. There's no different. They go the same height. They go the same distance down. They are the same identical graph every single time. So just kind of clarifying that too. So take a look at stimulus number two, our threshold stimulus here. So if you look up, how many action potentials were generated from a threshold stimulus? You got three action potentials that were generated from that threshold stimulus. So yeah, we, we generated action potentials. Specifically, we got three of them. Now, let's take a look at stimulus number three. We said we were going to get action potentials, and we did, but how many did we get from a larger stimulus? Do you see that we got more action potentials? That's how your body knows the difference. With a low stimulus, your body's not going to generate as many action potentials. With a stronger stimulus, you're going to get more action potentials coming into your brain. So your brain says, oh, wait, you're telling me not just three action potentials in a second. You're telling me you're sending me six in a second? Oh, wow, that's a bigger stimulus. Let me have a bigger response. So you can summarize this page by saying the stronger the stimulus... also known as graded potential, the more action potentials will be produced. So that's the big takeaway. Okay, so let's flip that page over, and you see another, another picture here. I'm going to change this. It shouldn't say minus 90. This should say minus 70 millivolts right there. Um, we still have our threshold. Now, if we've got a stimulus coming in that doesn't reach threshold, See, so we are at rest at minus 70. The stimulus comes along, changes the membrane potential to below threshold. That is called a sub-threshold stimulus. And how many action potentials are you going to get out of that? None. So how do you know by looking at the page you didn't get any action potentials? These lines over here are the action potentials. So you can see off of a sub-threshold stimulus, you don't have any lines coming off of that um, curve. So that means there's no action potentials that were generated there. Okay, so now let's take a look at a threshold stimulus. So the cell went back to rest again, minus 70. And then a stimulus comes along and it raises the membrane potential to threshold. So guess what that's called? A threshold stimulus. In a threshold stimulus, you're going to get the minimum number of action potentials produced. 
So what is the least number of action potentials a cell can make? That's what you're going to get from a threshold stimulus. So if you look at how many action potentials we got, a threshold stimulus, for example, generated one action potential. So when, it, when that one action potential arrives at the brain, the brain says, oh, it's a little bit of a change, but not a big change. You know, maybe blood pressure um, or maybe heart rate, which is supposed to be, you know, 70 beats per minute, maybe it's 68 beats per minute. So it's low, but it's not, um, it's not zero. Yeah, so it's, it's a little bit of a change, not a big change. So the brain would say, okay, throw a little bit of stuff out there to raise the heart rate just a little bit. We just need to get it back in range again. Um, now let's take a look. I'm going to skip. Um, the next one for a second, and we're going to take a look at the maximal stimulus. So again, the cell goes to rest, so it completely goes back to minus 70, and then you stimulate it again, another stimulus comes along, and look, it raises it well above threshold. This is what's going to be called a maximal stimulus because it's going to generate the maximum number of action potentials um, the cell can make. So a maximal stimulus will result in the maximum number of action potentials produced by the cell. And if you count them, you can see that there are five action potentials here that were generated. So in this instance, five is the most the cell can make. Now let's go backwards now to submaximal because this one should make more sense now. So again, the cell came to rest. A submaximal stimulus comes along. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to raise the membrane potential somewhere between threshold and maximum. So it's just somewhere between these two. That's why I said we have to kind of do that one in the middle. So the submaximal stimulus is going to create... Um, a number of action potentials more than minimum, but less than maximum. So if you look at how many action potentials were created, we have three. Well, that's more than the minimum and less than the maximum. So in reality, that submaximal stimulus could generate anywhere between two and four action potentials and be considered a submaximal stimulus. It's just less than maximal. Now, take a look at a supermaximal stimulus. Again, the cell comes to rest. And then a stimulus is applied, and look, wow, that goes way high above threshold. That is a supramaximal stimulus because you're stimulating it, but you're still only getting the maximum number of action potentials. You can't make more than the most you can make. So if you can only make five, it doesn't matter how much more intense the stimulus coming in is, your response is, I'm still going to make the most number of action potentials that I can make. So your body cannot differentiate between um, a maximal stimulus versus a super maximal stimulus. So let's say heart rate, which is supposed to be 70, let's say it drops to 30. Well, then it, the you know action potentials would fire and you get the most action potentials trying to tell your brain, hey, we dropped to 30. You need to do everything you can do to get this heart rate back up. But let's say it dropped to 20. It says, oh, my gosh, you have to get the heart rate back up. It's, you're still going to have the same response. Your brain is going to do the same thing. It's going to say, hey, we're going to do everything we can to get the heart rate back up to where it should be because this is, you know, an emergency situation here. But we can still do the most we can do. OK, so that's that's those. So I've got on here the definitions of those different types of stimuli. So if it's what's wrong way? If it's a sub-threshold stimulus, you're not going to get any action potentials. If it's a threshold stimulus, that cell, that neuron is going to produce the minimal number of action potentials that it can make. A sub-maximal stimulus is going to be somewhere between minimum and maximum. 
the maximal stimulus is the maximum number of action potentials that can be created. And a supermaximal stimulus, while the incoming stimulus is more intense, the number of action potentials created is going to be the same as it is for the maximal stimulus. Okay, so one of the things they say about our nervous system is that it's what's called frequency modulated. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I'm just throwing a different word out there. So you, we've already said the strength of the stimulus determines how many action potentials are produced. Stronger the stimulus, more action potentials, the weaker, the fewer. We've already said that. So summarizing that using the word frequency, you can say the intensity of the stimulus is related to the frequency of action potentials. So to rephrase that, the intensity of the stimulus is directly related to the number of action potentials produced in a second. The only thing frequency is doing is adding a time component to it. So we're not sitting here waiting on 10 action potentials to take place in an hour. We're saying, no, in one second interval of time, how many are we getting? So we're including an interval of time here. Again, if you don't get a, a threshold, it doesn't really matter. And I know we've been using numbers like, you know, three action potentials and five action potentials. But in reality, how many action potentials can a neuron actually fire in a second? It can fire between 200 and 300 in a second. So it's pretty, I mean, so we're using easier numbers to work with. But in reality, you can get two to 300 a second in a, in a pretty active neuron. Okay, so examples of stimuli and action potentials. So what I want to show you here <clears throat> is a little short <clears throat> video, by short, I mean like 10 seconds. Uh, what we've got here, this blue uh, neuron is being electrically stimulated artificially. So we're gonna supply this neuron with electricity and we're gonna change the intensity of this electrical stimulation. Um, and then we're gonna record what's happening at the axon hillock by that recording electrode. So the stimulus coming in is gonna be red, and you can see it down here, and this line is gonna show you the intensity of that incoming stimulus. And then the black is gonna be the recording electrode is what's happening at the axon hillock. So we're gonna see what that axon hillock does. So I'm telling you right now, this is a sub-threshold stimulus. So do you expect to see an action potential generated over here in black? No, you don't. It's that threshold. Sorry about the sound. That sound just means we've connected the circuit. So now the signal, now the um, neuron is getting that electrical signal. So you can see that neuron just got the electrical signal, but look how high that stimulus went. Well, not very high. And we didn't get an action potential produced. Again, it was submaximal. We didn't expect to get an action potential produced. So let me just kind of go forward and maybe let's take a look at a strong stimulus just for comparison. So again, this is going to be a stronger incoming electrical signal, and you're going to see that by the height of that red line right there. Okay, so the connection was made. That's where the sound comes from. Now look how much more stimulus, look how much more electricity was showing up, and then we can take a look at what's happening at the axon hillock now. So we got six action potentials generated from this because we had a strong enough stimulus coming in. So just kind of visually letting you see what's going on there. Another way you can look at this is, I don't know if y'all are familiar with horseshoe crabs or not, but uh, one way you can actually do this experiment, we are not doing this experiment here, but you could. So the horseshoe crab has got an eye, and that eye is picking up light intensity you know is it a dim light a strong light intense light what is it but how can you tell what the organism is really seeing so what they did was they cut a hole in the shell to expose the optic nerve now the optic nerve remember a nerve is axons that are running um down the neuron so this is a bunch of axons together so they're all generating electrical signals so they cut a hole in the shell they put electrodes around the axon to detect electricity as it's running down so they can figure out if the um, information is being sent from the eye to the brain. So in this first situation here, we have a very dim light. And if you look, there is no neural activity. That means while the eye was picking up the light, it wasn't intense enough to generate a response. 
the signal died out before it made it to the axon, so nothing's happening. Now, if we increase the intensity of light a little bit, notice there's a little bit more light now in the light bulb. Um, now, the organism is picking up that the light is a little bit brighter. And you can see in one second interval of time, it looks like we've got about 10 action potentials that are being generated. So the organism knows it's in a little bit more lit environment than it was before. And if you increase the intensity of light even more, make the light bulb a little bit brighter, you can see that the organism is now going to be firing, again, just making that up, maybe about 20 action potentials every second. So when it gets to the brain, the organism knows, oh, okay, it's more light than it was a second ago. And then if you increase the intensity of light to the maximum amount, you can see the light bulb's a little bit brighter, you can see the organism is now firing, I'm just making this number up because I'm not going to count all those, um, 30 action potentials every second. So now the organism knows it's in a very brightly lit environment. So that's one way you can kind of tell. So information was coming into the eye, but not all of it went down the axon to tell the brain about it. Some of it died out before it got there. So in the same interval of time, if you have a weak stimulus, you might fire 12 action potentials in a second or in some interval of time. In a moderate stimulus, you might fire 24 action potentials in a second. And then for a strong stimulus, you might fire 36 action potentials in a second. So this is what we're talking about with frequency. We're just including the unit of time, a second, and what we've got going on. Um, so another thing we're going to take a look at, does anybody have any questions before we go on to the next little section here? So how does the cell know? We've got to remember the axon terminal sends the information that's coming into the next cell. So how does the axon terminal know what to send? So again, we've got the incoming signal coming in, but the synapse is where that electrical signal gets converted to a chemical signal and goes to the next cell. What's happening there? How does the cell know what to talk to the next cell about? So let's take a look at our picture here. So we've got our next handouts. This is our last handout for the day. So we have our weak stimulus compared to our strong stimulus. We're first going to look at the top, which is a weak stimulus. And remember, stimulus is a problem. So we're going to say um, if heart rate is normally 70 beats per minute, we're going to say heart rate is now 60 beats per minute. So this is our problem. This is our stimulus. And it's fairly weak. Again, if 70 is normal, this is just a little bit below normal. Um, you see this sensory nerve ending right here? That's just a fancy way of saying, hey, that's the dendrite. Remember, that's where information comes in. So this graded potential is coming into the cell, and when it came in, it was measured at, uh, it looks like about minus 20 millivolts coming in. Now, we know that it's a graded potential. One of the characteristics of a graded potential is it gets weaker as it moves to the axon hillock. So if you take a look at the trigger zone, also known as the axon hillock, this is the one that determines what we're going to do with that signal. So if you take a look at the measurement that's being taken there, we have our signal, which has diminished, but it's sitting at about maybe minus 40 millivolts. Now, the axon hillock decides, hey, are we going to generate an action potential or not? And in this case, absolutely, we did generate an action potential. As a matter of fact, you can count them. There are four action potentials that were generated at the axon hillock. So the action potential, remember what the job of the axon is. The axon is going to take that action potential. That was generated at the axon hillock. And make sure it doesn't change. 
the information that moves down the axon should not change. That's the job of the axon, to maintain the integrity of the signal. So if it came in at four action potentials, if we take a measurement, oh, I don't know, about halfway down the cell, we better find out that we're still generating the same number of action potentials because that's the job of the axon to make sure the action potentials do not change. We want them to stay the same amount. So now we've got to deal with, okay, what's happening here at the um, axon terminal? Remember the job of the axon terminal? Its job is to convert the action potentials to a neurotransmitter. So inside these axon terminals, we have neurotransmitter. Remember that chemical, that ligand? Um, and we're going to say our neurotransmitter in this example is epinephrine. Fight or flight, speed everything up. So these four action potentials, by the time they get to the axon terminal, it's going to cause the release of four neurotransmitters to be released. And we're going to call that neurotransmitter epinephrine. So what's it going to do? Well, when it gets to the heart, that epinephrine is going to speed the heart up. Just a little. We only secreted four neurotransmitter molecules, so we're just going to speed the heart up a little. Remember, it only dropped to 60, 60 beats per minute, so we need to speed it back up to 70. So we're just going to secrete a little bit of neurotransmitter. Now, let's take a look at a strong stimulus. So that would be an example of... Okay, the problem, if heart rate is normally 70, let's say the heart rate is now 30 beats per minute. That's a pretty strong, intense stimulus. That's a big change from normal. So our stimulus is going to be strong. Now, remember, we still have our sensory ending, which is a dendrite. And our measurement taken as that graded potential comes in is going to be measured and it's sitting at what looks like about zero millivolts. So much different than minus 20, right? So it went a little bit higher up. It was a bit stronger stimulus coming in. Now, as that graded potential moves its way towards the axon hillock, we know that it's going to decrease in intensity. And again, that trigger zone is the axon hillock. And this is the one that makes a decision on what to do with this incoming signal. So it says, wow, that's a pretty strong signal. And how do I know it's strong? Well, because by the time it reached the axon hillock, it was at minus 20 millivolts. So that minus 20 millivolts caused the cell to generate seven action potentials per second. And we know that as it moves down the axon, there should be no change in the intensity of that signal. So if we take a measurement about halfway down the axon, we should see that it's still running at seven action potentials per second. So we should still see that. And again, that's the whole time it's running down the entire axon. That action potential, the number that are created is not gonna change. Now, by the time it reaches the axon terminal, notice how much neurotransmitter is released now. Where with a small stimulus, we had four neurotransmitter molecules released, but with the strong stimulus, we can say there are 15 neurotransmitter molecules released. Now, remember, we went ahead and said, hey, our neurotransmitter that we're dealing with here is epinephrine. So if we've got our heart over here that's going to be receiving those 15 epinephrine molecules, that's going to speed up a lot in comparison. So the more epinephrine secreted, the more of um, a change, you know, that heart's going to respond accordingly versus just a little bit of epinephrine that's secreted. So that's how the information 
remains intact. So the front of the neuron has the same information going out as it's leaving the neuron. Okay, so I know y'all, I know this is a heavy day content wise today. I mean, I get that. This is a hard day today. That was all of our um, pictures though. So now we can kind of take a breather and take a look at objective six. Objective six deals with the characteristics of a resting neuron. You guys already know the answer to this because we drew this out the other day with objective four. Do you remember the neuron that we talked about that we drew at rest and we labeled everything? We put down where the potassium was. We put down where the sodium was. So this is the same picture that we, I mean, it's the same information. I'm not giving you anything new that we didn't already know. Um, we've got the resting neuron. We've got a lot of sodium on the outside of the cell. We've got a lot of potassium on the inside of the cell. And if you take a look at these arrows here, You recognize that potassium leaving the cell? Look how big that arrow is compared to the smaller area arrow, which represents the sodium coming in. So what does the size of the arrow tell you? We've got more potassium leaving than we have sodium coming in. Remember, this is traveling through leak ion channels. And remember, we said that potassium has three times as many leak channels as sodium does. So we just have more potassium leaving than we have sodium coming in. We also have the um, sodium potassium pump, which is resetting all the ions and putting them on the correct side. Again, making sure that we maintain this high sodium concentration outside and high potassium concentration inside. Um, now, we've already said this, the charge inside the cell is negative, the charge outside the cell is positive, but I wanted to give you a new word that we're going to talk more about on Tuesday, and that's polarized. So yes, we said the resting neuron has a charge of minus 70. Another way to say that is just to say the axon's polarized. So that's the, and if you say that, you're like, okay, it's at rest and it's at minus 70. What causes the resting neuron to stay at minus 70? There are two proteins that are involved in maintaining that minus 70. One is that sodium potassium pump, it's resetting everything. And the other one are those leak ion channels. We said because more potassium is leaving the cell, positively charged potassium leaving than sodium coming in, it causes the inside of the cell to be negative and the outside to be positive. So those are the two protein channels responsible for that minus 70 resting neuron charge. There's a video here for you guys to watch. I encourage you to watch it. Um, it visually helps explain the resting neuron charge, and it talks about the leak ion channels a little bit. Um, just everything we've already kind of talked about. And you've got some um, activities to do, and I am going to push all those dates out to be April the 4th if I haven't already done that for your class. So it looks like we've got Markayla here. Yes, ma'am. 